Alice in Wonderland was released in 1951 by Walt Disney Animation and is their 13th animated film and is based on the Lewis Carroll novel of the same name. As such, the film follows a young girl, Alice, who falls down a rabbit hole into the nonsensical world of Wonderland that is ruled by the Queen of Hearts while she encounters strange creatures such as the Mad Hatter and the Cheshire Cat. A very happy new year to everyone. I hope your holidays all went well and after taking a little bit of a break, I'm ready to get back into producing a ton of movie reviews going forward. And just like last year, we're starting out with another Disney animated film Alice in Wonderland. I grew up with this film and watched it a ton as a kid and I'll always have a soft spot for it because every time I revisit it, there are images that just become stuck in my head. I'm reminded of where I was when I was watching this and what I was doing and watching a movie and regaining some of those past memories is always a magical feeling. However, the last time I had watched this film was when I was very young and only revisited it only a few years ago. And despite having those good memories of watching this movie, I can't say it's one of my favorites when it comes to the Disney Animation Library, but it's still a fun watch nonetheless. But before we get into all of that, let's do what we always do here and go behind the scenes to see just how this film was made. Walt Disney and Alice in Wonderland have a long history together, which dates back to as far as 1923, while he was working at Laugh-O-Gram Studios, where he made a short film loosely inspired by Alice in Wonderland. However, the film was never released to the public after Laugh-O-Gram Studio filed for bankruptcy. Disney would, however, use the film to show potential distributors when he left for Hollywood. Winkler Pictures eventually agreed to distribute the film, and Walt Disney went on to partner with his brother to form Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio, which was rebranded as Walt Disney Productions. The Alice comedies started work in 1924 and then ended in 1927. In June of 1932, Roy Disney was interested in acquiring the rights to the Alice books, which were in the public domain, and Mary Pickford went on to propose a feature-length Alice in Wonderland film, which would combine her live-action performance with an animated Wonderland. Disney was hesitant about the idea, and it never moved forward. It wasn't until after the enormous success of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs that Disney acquired the rights to the books. He went on to hire storyboard artist Al Perkins to then develop the story, and by September of 1938, Perkins had compiled a 161-page analysis of the book, with ideas of the story treatment and descriptions of scenes. In 1939, British illustrator David Hall joined the studio and began work on concept art for the film. A Like a Reel was completed, but Disney wasn't pleased, believing the artwork resembled the illustrations of Tennell's art from the books too much and would be too difficult to animate. The tone of Perkins' script was also too dark for what he was wanting. After this, he became disinterested with the project and decided to let it sit for a while. But it was still in development, just very slowly. But with the underperformance of films like Pinocchio and Fantasia and the start of World War II, Disney was restricted to making animated shorts and finishing films that were already in production, such as Dumbo and Bambi. Because of this, Alice in Wonderland was shelved. Disney had attempted to revive Alice in Wonderland in 1943 with new storyboards, but the project didn't move forward. In 1945, British author Aldous Huxley was hired to work on the story, but his adaptation was deemed too literal. Background artist Mary Blair was hired to move away from Tennell's illustrations with bold, unreal colors, which Disney seemed to like, and the story was rewritten to focus on comedy, music, and the whimsical side of the books. The film would eventually be scheduled for release in 1950, with animation crews for Alice in Wonderland and Cinderella competing against each other to see who would finish first. And by early 1948, Cinderella had progressed farther than Alice in Wonderland. 
When it came to the film's music, Disney wanted to retain Carol's imaginative poems and commissioned songwriters to compose songs built around them, with 30 potential songs being written and many which ended up being in the final film, if only for a few seconds. In 1939, Frank Churchill was assigned to compose songs which were accompanied by a story reel featuring the artwork of David S. Hall, but none of his songs were used for the finished film. The composers on Cinderella also worked on songs for Alice in Wonderland, but the only song of theirs to make it into the film was the Unbirthday song. Sammy Fain and Bob Hillard worked on songs together, one of which became the title song for Peter Pan, only with changed lyrics. The film finally premiered at the Leicester Square Theatre in London on July 26, 1951, with lukewarm reception. The movie grossed $2.4 million domestically, but with a budget of $3 million, they took a million dollar loss. The film would be re-released in 1974, where it grossed $3.5 million. As for the reviews, the film was initially received negatively, believing the film watered down the Carol novel and Americanized it. But the film has since then been reevaluated by many as one of the better Disney animated movies. As for the legacy of the film, when people think of Alice in Wonderland now, they think of this film and the characters and designs such as the Mad Hatter, Cheshire Cat, and White Rabbit have become immortalized as classic animated characters. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's go into my thoughts on the film. As I mentioned before, I grew up watching this movie, so I'm always going to get a nostalgic rush when watching it. But I also want to bring up something too. A lot of times, nostalgia can very well cloud our judgment of things, but I've tried my best to stay clear of that. But also be aware of it because nostalgia can be a good or bad thing. I have nostalgia for films like Bambi, Pinocchio, Melody Time, which we've previously covered, and my nostalgia has helped some in shaping my opinion of those films. But I also have my own thoughts on those films as well that is stripped away from the nostalgia. And I still love Bambi. And to me, it's perhaps the crowning achievement of animation. And I love Pinocchio as well as really enjoying Melody Time. But I recognize that film had flaws in it. Now we come to Alice in Wonderland. And despite my nostalgia for this film, that doesn't mean I just automatically like it. In fact, I think Alice in Wonderland is a pretty solid, fun, and creative film, but it's also far from a favorite of mine. I realized too while watching the film this time why I loved this film so much as a kid, and I think it came down to this, and perhaps it's the same as Melody Time as well. There are sequences I love in the film, but I realized I never truly devoted my full attention to it as a kid. So despite the nostalgia revisiting the film, especially the last three or four times I've watched it since 2018, I come away with very little to offer. Alice in Wonderland is a wild ride from beginning to end. It's a bonkers world with strange things happening at every turn, and I admire that about it so much. The film is a surreal fever dream that reminds me a lot of what Disney tried to do in The Three Caballeros and failed at. But I think the film succeeds in making a surrealist nightmare that is fun and engaging to watch once you get to the particular set pieces in the film. The animation is beautiful. It's a very vibrant film with a lot of bright colors offset by some dark backgrounds that makes Wonderland feel both magical and hostile at all the same time. Disney's animators crafted a very interesting look for the world that allows the film to stand out and become recognizable as coming from Alice in Wonderland. The fluidity of the animation is also great to see. There's so much moving parts, especially in the tea party scene, and the film can feel random and chaotic at times, which I think works in the film's favor and makes it unique from Disney's more straightforward tales. An image that's always stuck in my head is right when Alice falls 
down the rabbit hole and we're introduced to all these weird images as she falls down and her dress becomes stiff like an umbrella and she floats to the floor. There's also a lot of abstraction with the walls and doors that reminds me of the off-kilter designs from the silent film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and it's just really cool to see. Something I also love in the film are the weird and eccentric characters we meet throughout the film, whether it's the White Rabbit, who seems to always be running late, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, or the March Hare and the Mad Hatter. Each character Alice comes across is memorable and leaves an impression on you. Ed Wynn's lispy voice acting as the Mad Hatter is so iconic and filled with chaotic energy, and he's just a standout. My favorite characters, though, have to be the Cheshire Cat, played by the always great Sterling Holloway, as well as the Queen of Hearts herself, who is this big, bombastic personality. And though I would never really call her much of a antagonist, she is a great threat towards the end. And her husband, the King, who is ridiculously short is just a fun and memorable design. Honestly, my least favorite character in Alice in Wonderland happens to be Alice herself, who just is not all that likable of a protagonist. There's just nothing about her to get me to really care about her or her plight until a moment later on in the film. She just kind of comes across as a little bit of a brat to me, especially earlier on, but the moment that does get me is her low point where she's alone in the forest. The moment does manage to get an emotion out of me. I just wish she had the same amount of time that someone like Cinderella had for us to get to know the character. She's not a terrible protagonist though. She's just not all that memorable and a little unlikable as well. But I do appreciate an attempt to make a pretty unruly childlike character. I think that comes across well actually. I just wish I cared for the character more. And I'll say this too, and some of it I feel is intentional, but I think it ultimately comes down to preference. But I find this film just very mean and at times unlikable. Wonderland is a very hostile and rude place, which almost embodies what Alice wants to be. She wants to live in a world of her own, as the first song of the film brings up, and the world is very childlike in some of the worst qualities, and I find that interesting, and it works thematically, but it doesn't entertain me. I also find the movie to just be very dry overall. For a 75 minute film, I felt every minute of that runtime, and it's sad because the movie is made up of some really fun set pieces, from the tea party to Alice growing big, or her encounter with all the various characters. But the film drags some of these scenes, or the scenes between those scenes, out for way too long, and we run into a film that just meanders around from scene to scene in the end, which is a bit disappointing because there are some great sequences here that are fun to watch, but the pace at which they're told is too slow to be as effective as I think they could be. The songs for the most part fall kind of flat for me. Some are actually pretty good though, such as the opening credit song, which is wonderfully dreamlike, and Alice's opening song, which sets up her childlike wants. The Caterpillar's song, which is wonderfully hypnotic, and of course, there's the unbirthday song. But other than those, some of the songs are just not all that memorable or too short, and some of that comes from Disney's insistence on using Carol's poems as the basis for songs in the film. The movie just lacks that kind of energy and becomes kind of drab in some parts. This isn't a slight on any of the songs though. They're good, just not a whole lot of them end up standing out. And I'm also just not a big fan of Catherine Beaumont's vocals as Alice. I feel bad that I've been talking fairly negative about this film and I want to reiterate that I do like this film even with the problems I have with it, such as the songs, the main character, the film's mean-spiritedness and pacing, there are moments that I think really do shine. Some musical moments are brilliant, and the interesting and weird characters are a delight to watch. But it definitely is a film that I like more for those moments than the entire film, which 
looking back at how I watched this film as a kid makes a whole lot of sense. I was always captivated by certain scenes that were memorable to me. But never the film as a whole, which is similar to how I felt with Melody Time, another film I watched a lot as a kid. But I never was fully engaged through that film during the entirety of its runtime. But more so with the sequences that really spoke to me. And that's the same with this film. Alice in Wonderland is a good film, but it's marred by a lot of things that I think bring the film down for me. It's enjoyable, but some things just don't manage to hook my attention like many of the other Disney films I've reviewed and absolutely love. This honestly reminds me a lot of my thoughts with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which is a beloved classic that I ultimately just find good. But I would say now I actually prefer Snow White over something like Alice in Wonderland. For one, the more I watch that film, the more I appreciate it, and Snow White leaves me with this magical feeling that is just absent from Alice in Wonderland. The film is flawed, but I admire its uniqueness and its bizarre imagery and fantastical cast of characters. It's just one that I end up watching and just think, well, that was fun. On to the next one. It's not a film that really sticks with me like some of Disney's other films, but when I do watch it, I'm still filled with fond memories from my childhood, and to me, that's worth something in the end. I just wish I could love the rest of the film as much as I cherish those memories. So, with all of that said, I'm gonna give Alice in Wonderland a 7 out of 10. I feel bad that I didn't like this film as much on this go-around, but I realize now I only love segments of the film rather than the complete experience. It's still a good film nonetheless, and it can be a lot of fun watching several of the bright and colorful sequences when it's focusing on the weirdness of Wonderland itself. If Alice in Wonderland is one of your favorites, I think that's pretty cool because there is a lot to like and admire about the film. I'm just not the biggest fan of it overall. But that's all I've got for you guys. Next week, we'll be finishing up our look at the Wizarding World franchise with Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. And I'll probably end up following that up with a ranking video as well. So look forward to that. But I hope you enjoyed this review. And as always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And stay positive.